Hello and welcome everyone to what is really a really exciting November evening. Thank you for, for making the effort to turn up today. Um, as one last quick reminder, please turn cameras on. It's really nice to see people, but um, please keep uh, yourself muted. Otherwise, it can cause lots of uh, interruptions, interactions. Um, we have a fantastic talk today by Dr. Flavia Panzari. Uh, Flavia is lead researcher at the Institute of Biological Systems. Uh, it's Italian National Research Council. She's also a scientific associate at the Botanical Div uh, Diversity Life Science Department, the Natural History Museum in London, where she currently resides. She's an expert of paper and parchment biodeterioration and has been in charge of responsible analysis of unique art objects, such as Leonardo da Vinci's self-portraits and the Archimedes Palimpest. Her publications cover fungal bacterial ecology, geomicrobiology, physiology and community, ecology in soils and indoor museums, libraries and archives. For example, she's the editor of the Journal of Applied Microbiology, a member of the Council of International uh, of Biodegradation and Biodegradation Society. In short, what a steal and going to be a fantastic speaker. Today she'll be talking about fungi and skeletons, um, and it's going to be really exciting. So without further ado, I'll stop there and I'll pass over to Dr. Flavia Pinzari. Thank you, Nathan, for your very kind uh, introduction. And I would like also to thank Emma and the British Mycological Society for uh, uh, inviting me to, to give this talk. So the talk is about uh, fungi in uh, skeletons, uh, but I will start from the cycle of phosphorus in soil and in the environment in general, because it is quite related to the, to the topic. In fact, uh, phosphorus is a, a very important element. It's a key element and is present in the DNA, RNA, ATP, and also in phospholipids in all the organism or the living organism. And uh, usually in soil, uh, it's present in very low amounts. This is because uh, Despite the presence of uh, lots of rocks that contain uh, phosphorus, like the apatites, uh, most of these uh, rocks uh, contain phosphorus in, uh, in a form which is not available to plants in particular, but also to other organisms. And uh, apatite can be uh, leached, can be weathered by microorganisms and fungi in particular. Uh, the forms that can be uh, assimilated, the, the phosphorus forms, are uh, soluble forms that can be uh, also uh, uh, released in waters and lost uh, towards uh, uh, rivers and, uh, and uh, superficial waters. So phosphorus is a, a precious element. And for um, intensive agriculture, it is necessary to add phosphorus to crops, to soils used for cropping. And the way phosphorus is added is by using mineral fertilizers, which contains phosphorus in a very uh, easily available form because it is uh, made, the mineral fertilizers are produced by acidif uh, acidification of primary minerals, so apatites. And, but once this phosphorus in mineral uh, fertilizers is added to, to soil, it precipitates very fastly uh, into secondary mm -hmm. compounds, which are as well very uh, little soluble. So they are very stable in soil. All these uh, passages, in some ways, are uh, managed by fungi. In fact, uh, we have fungi uh, that can uh, mineralize uh, uh, phosphorus from the organic uh, uh, matter. Uh, they can also. Uh, take the soluble forms and organicate into uh, mycelial biomass. They can uh, send, uh, give the, the phosphorus to plants through the mycorrhiza, uh, and they can also weather uh, the primary minerals releasing soluble forms of phosphorus. So these are all processes that can be uh, led by fungi. So they are really important in the phosphorus cycle. To show uh, this uh, in a, an experiment uh, uh, together with a group of researchers in Rome, uh, we uh, studied uh, the uh, group of uh, saprotrophic fungi living in soil. Uh, 
just to um, evaluate how this organism can um, weather a very insoluble form of uh, phosphate, which is the tricalcium phosphate. And we uh, analyzed uh, in particular how the mycelium can uh, take the, uh, the phosphorus in a depleted medium. So there is a liquid medium in this vial uh, containing um, all the elements, but not phosphorus. And the only phosphorus uh, given to the system was this unsoluble form, which was on the bottom. And the mycelium was grown on top of this uh, system, uh, not in touch with the, with the calcium phosphate. And this was to see if the fungi could uh, solubilize uh, the, the tricalcium phosphate uh, without touching it and uh, also um, growing on the, on the top of the system. And we use different uh, fungal species. And as uh, expected, we found that the mechanism were quite different. Uh, for example, we have here, I don't know, it, it is a little, it's small, but I hope you can read it. We have that some species like this phycomyces from a starting pH of the medium of 6.4, uh, just uh, um, uh, grew, so uptake some phosphorus from the tricalcium phosphate without using acidic compounds because the pH of the system was still quite, quite high, was 6.36. So the mechanism used by this phycomyces nitens, nitens was not acidification of the medium. While in, in the case of Aspergillus niger, we have a, a lowering of pH very, very strong. We have uh, from six to two of pH, which means that the, the, the mechanism used by the Aspergillus was uh, to acidify the medium uh, and solubilize the tricalcium phosphate. Uh, in, in the, in, in, the other species also had different mechanisms. And in the, these are the scanning electron microscope images taken with a backscattering electron uh, system uh, of the, only the mycelium. So what grew on top of, the, of this uh, plastic element. So it was not in touch with the tricalcium phosphate. Everything was brought in the mycelium, was translocated by the fungi through the medium. So solubilized and then uh, re-precipitated in the mycelium. As in this case, which are um, in the, the mini medusa polyspora, where some uh, uh, nice uh, uh, calcium oxalate crystals were formed, or in the case, here it is well seen, in the case of these phycomyces and uh, nitens, where some uh, uh, um, granules of uh, probably polyphosphates were uh, produced along with some calcite uh, secondary minerals. And in the in Aspergillus niger, in the biomass, we found both um, oxalates, but also some amorphous uh, precipitates made of uh, mainly um, phosphorus and calcium. So again, either some uh, secondary phosphates or uh, some other organic forms of phosphorus. So, this happens uh, in, uh, in fungi growing in soil uh, on phosphates, on uh, tricalcium phosphate. But other forms of phosphates is uh, uh, also the bone. Bone mineral uh, and the ivory are formed predominantly from a carbonated uh, hydroxyapatite. So we don't, uh, we have um, phosphatic rocks, but also uh, organic uh, phosphorus. So the phosphorus which um, uh, constitutes the skeleton of all the vertebrates. And in the uh, ivory, for example, the um, hydroxyapatite is even denser than in bones. So we have very dense hydroxyapatite with uh, uh, very strong structures. And uh, uh, why studying uh, the biodegradation of bones? There are many disciplines that are interested in how fungi can uh, uh, attack bones, for example, in soil. Paleopathology, studying, for example, the ancient uh, in, um, epidemics, for example, uh, and illnesses, and also forensics. And I'm going to give uh, an example of how uh, the study of uh, 
biodeterioration in that case of dentin, so ivory uh, material, can be uh, of interest of archaeology. This is the case of the uh, chessmen, which are very beautiful um, medieval uh, carved uh, chessmen, which were found uh, in the Isle of Lewis in the Northern England, um, in Scotland. And uh, um, these chessmen were um, discovered in a very contrasting, uh, uh, with a very contrasting uh, um, circumstances. So they were probably, um, they probably they belonged to a merchant traveling by ship from uh, Norway to Ireland. But um, there are some theories on how they were found because it is not clear. They may have been uh, shipwrecked. So probably they were found buried in, uh, in the seashore in touch with water or they may have been uh, um, intentionally buried in the, in the sand or in the, in the pit, even in the pit. So there are different theories on how this has been uh, discovered. It is not sure. And on the chessmen, there are some tracks, interesting tracks, not on all the pieces, of, on some of them. So uh, these tracks have been intensely studied to evaluate what was the uh, discovery, how, how were these discovered in the, in the island. So um, these tracks could be the result of uh, some kind of biodeterioration that could be marine or terrestrial. And uh, the shape of the tracks can resemble the, the way that some uh, sponges uh, produces on carbonatic rocks and on the shell of some shells. So they, there could be uh, an involvement of marine organism. In that case, the hypothesis of the burial due to a ship, shipwreck, so a, a sort of a, a, a recovery through a seashore or the sea uh, could be the right one. But um, we wanted to evaluate the possibility that this kind of tracks uh, were produced by fungi in soil. So the first thing to do, since there weren't many papers on this topic, was to evaluate the speed and the, the ability of fungi to uh, dissolve or to produce this kind of tracks on uh, dentin, which is the material of which uh, uh, the teeth, the tusks are made. The, um, the chessmen are made of uh, boar tusks. Well, sorry, uh, walrus tusks. Um, so very, very hard, very thick kind of uh, ivory. And we put some parts of this uh, boar tusk into a plate, sorry, with some uh, agar and uh, a fungus, which is an aspergillus. And uh, um, what happened is that the piece of uh, uh, ivory totally dissolved in a few days. So uh, we could uh, show that the, 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 the fungi, in, in that case, the aspergillus, which is producing strong uh, organic acids, dissolved the apatite, even if it is a very strong material, very hard kind of hydroxy apatite. And this halo that you can see on the reverse of the plate is uh, made of uh, mainly um, calcium oxalates in different uh, hydration forms. So the weather light and the weather light. And you can see that on the, in this cross section at the optical microscope, there is a layer, a clear layer of uh, minerals, secondary minerals. These are the fungi, the conidiophora with conidia, the aspergillus, and this is the pristine uh, ivory. And looking at the scanning electron microscope, you can see that this is the apatite. And there is a layer of uh, uh, secondary minerals, mainly uh, um, oxalates, uh, calcium oxalates. The mycelium, which is uh, uh, also containing some IFE covered with uh, calcite, uh, and also uh, some other minerals which were concentrated in the mycelium, like potassium. Uh, so uh, 
removing the mycelium from the surface, this is the pristine uh, appearance of the task. Uh, after a removal of the mycelium, there were some tracks which were deep and large enough to be compared with the tracks that we found on the chessmen. Clearly, uh, the, the pattern of these tracks uh, was uh, quite different from what we found using simply uh, an Aspergillus species. So one idea, one hypo another hypo hypothesis is that uh, the tracks were the result of, a, mm, let's say, a burial in the soil where some uh, grasses were growing. For example, maran grass, uh, the roots of maran grass uh, uh, have a development with, with uh, some, with the thickness and the kind of uh, network which is very resembling what observed on the surface of the chessmen. Uh, but of course, the, the maran grass is producing some acidic compounds, the roots, but not enough to, to produce this kind of uh, uh, tracks and channels. So one possibility is that the tracks were due to maran grass roots, but also to mycorrhizal, um, uh, like ectomycorrhiza that can uh, enhance the production of yeah. acidic compounds from the, from the roots. Uh, now, we talked about what happens in soil, but uh, we also investigated what happens to uh, bones, which are uh, conserved into a, an indoor environment like a museum. And the chance for uh, performing this kind of uh, study came in 2017, uh, when uh, at the Natural History Museum, the, um, the DP uh, cast, which was a diplodocus uh, skeleton, casted skeleton, was removed and replaced with, uh, with OAP, uh, um, which is a very huge skeleton, real skeleton of a whale, of a blue whale. And uh, this uh, um, hope uh, uh, skeleton is uh, 136 year old, 25 meters long, and now it's uh, 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 exhibited in the main hall of the museum. And uh, it was um, previously displayed in another uh -huh. hall. Uh, it was uh, exposed, there, exposed there for at least uh, 80 years. Of course, it was dusted time by time, but in many parts of this uh, skeleton, there were um, some, um, there was the dust of eight years of uh, indoor exp uh, exposure. So um, thanks to a grant by the synthesis project, we could study the surface of these uh, bones. And uh, the bones were uh, dismounted by conservators in uh, 2016 and all the nails, the iron nails and the plaster, which was covered, which was uh, connecting all the, the different bones was removed. And we immediately noticed that, uh, especially on the porous parts of the bones, there were many um, uh, areas covered with uh, something very uh, similar to uh, fungal mycelium. And the study was mainly, the purpose of the study was mainly to compare the clean areas with the areas which were not uh, clean. So to see how uh, good was the cleaning. But then we also sampled with, uh, with some adhesive tapes, the porous areas which were uh, covered with uh, fun, presumably, presumably with fungi. And uh, we couldn't take large parts, only small particles. And we observed the particles with the different electronic and optical uh, microscopy. And uh, all the particles were very complex in the composition. They were um, still keeping some parts of bone, but also uh, areas covered with plaster and with secondary biogenic uh, elements. Uh, this is a mapping made with um, uh, microanalysis, scanning electron microscopy. And you see that there, is a, there are some areas with bone containing phos uh, phosphorus and calcium, and then uh, lots of gypsum from, from the plaster, which was used to um, assemble the bones in the, in the skeleton, the, in the sample, uh, and then 
these other uh, minerals here, which were uh, identified as uh, calcite, presumably secondary deposited. Uh, and in, the, in these particles, uh, um, analyzing the, the, the composition uh, and the concentration of phosphorus and calcium, it was clear that in some areas, uh, the bone was still uh, containing the right ratio between calcium and phosphorus. But in, in some areas, there were um, other structures where the ratio was different. So the, there was a depletion in the concentration of the phosphorus. And then the plaster, which was containing only traces of phosphorus. So there was a sort of a leaching of the phosphates uh, in, the, in the bones. Other interesting elements uh, that we documented in these uh, particles were um, some uh, fungal elements like uh, these uh, budding cells, which uh, were presumably yeasts. And they were um, always uh, somehow uh, attached to surfaces with a sort of uh, uh, biological uh, biofilm, a sort of glue. Uh, and there were many of them. In some particles, uh, some particles were uh, practically covered with these cells. And interestingly, uh, mapping with the, uh, for the phosphorus uh, element, um, we found that, uh, for example, sorry, the, the, the background was organic. So it was probably a biofilm with <laughs> cells. And the, all these uh, biological elements, all these fungi, fungal cells, were covered with particles of uh, phosphorus. So they were um, uh, attracting or uh, absorbing phosphorus from the background. And with the, uh, the optical microscopy, we could see that there were many uh, different elements, fungal elements, like uh, conidia, but also something similar to uh, hull cells uh, and cleistotasia. So there were many different species uh, in, the, in the samples. And observing them with a stain for uh, vital uh, uh, elements, we found that some of them were still alive. Uh, among the particles, uh, uh, among the, the different um, uh, particles, some were covered with another kind, another species of fungus, uh, may, uh, which was producing these chains of conidia, uh, very characteristics, and uh, with uh, conidia with a truncate base. And they were associated very often with uh, also these uh, um, uh, shapes that were made of uh, iron. So not only bone, but also bubbles made of uh, uh, iron. and uh, sometimes gypsum. Uh, analyzing these, uh, these structures, we found that they were um, containing externally a sort of a, a shell made of iron. And they, uh, they were filled with uh, some cells, some conidia. And inside the, the, the shells, there was also calcium and sulfur and phosphorus. So there were some salts. Uh, inside, uh, of very often calcium sulfate, so gypsum, and externally uh, iron. And in these nodules, sometimes inside the nodules, there was something organic. So it was not uh, gypsum. Gypsum was externally, and it was not uh, other stuff. It was organic material, probably, and uh, it was covered with the iron. This, these are those bubbles crushed. <clears throat> and uh, looking closely to these uh, iron bubbles, we found that they were uh, covered with uh, uh, different forms of uh, iron oxides, uh, and that especially this, um, some of these shells were containing uh, different layers. They were uh, like structured, like, uh, like if they were produced in different times, hmm? like uh, growing chambers inside. 
Um, and the rust was showing different shapes of oxidation. Now, one possible mechanism that was uh, hypothesized in, uh, in this work is uh, uh, that uh, on the surface of the nails, which were um, keeping the bones together, made of iron, uh, some kind of uh, um, electrochemical process was uh, going on, uh, especially uh, because of the, um, the position of uh, uh, water uh, when the, the temperatures were, were going down. So at, at the dew point, some water, some condensed water uh, can have produced a sort of a, um, microenvironment where the presence of fungi uh, and, uh, for example, the, the organic acids produced by fungi could have started this process uh, of, um, sorry, where uh, some uh, chemical uh, acidic uh, compounds uh, acted uh, in, the, in the formation of uh, um, this electrochemical cell. And the iron um, was oxidizing and depositing on the fungal structures. So it is not quite completely clear if the process was uh, passive uh, in, in the sense that uh, it was uh, not actively um, uh, induced by fungi, but just uh, uh, occurring on the exopolymeric materials that were deposited by fungi also after the death of the fungi, for example. But what was clear is that the process was going on producing different layers according to the um, changes in the, in, the, in the humidity of the air. So something li uh, linked to the uh, the cyclic uh, um, deposition of uh, water drops on the nails and the cyclic uh, uh, activation of uh, fungal uh, acidic compounds, organic compounds. So this, this is what we hypothesized. And uh, the, 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 the organism mostly associated with this, uh, this structure is this um, this fungus here, uh, that from the um, morphology initially was um, attributed to a Scopulariopsis species, or maybe um, a microascus, which uh, is the, 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 the perfect form of the, sorry, the perfect form of uh, many species of Scopulariopsis. Uh, and it was really um, interesting because uh, on the surface of this uh, conidia, uh, there were many um, ornamentation which were actually uh, the position of uh, uh, platelets of uh, either uh, sulfates or calcium phosphates. And uh, the structures were clearly uh, produced um, also in clusters and some of them were uh, inside these shells. So their development was strongly associated with the, the, this process of uh, iron deposition on um, some uh, uh, other salts. Uh, and looking closely, we can see that there are many uh, um, different secondary minerals formed around and on top of this, uh, of this uh, conidia. And not far from uh, these, uh, these structures, there are very often these secondary uh, um, crystals, which were identified as uh, uh, calcium phosphates. So hydroxyapatites, sorry. So these are secondary hydroxyapatites, which were formed uh, attached to the fungal structure and around the, the development of the mycelium and inside these uh, iron-containing sh uh, shells. Uh, so probably uh, the, the, the fungal uh, um, structure, uh, structures acted as uh, templates for the uh, crystallization of the secondary appetite. Uh, and this is uh, due to the presence of uh, elements on the, on the walls of the fungi uh, some exopolysaccharides uh, and proteins uh, that
can act uh, as a sort of molecular glue for biominerals. And uh, in particular, the carboxyl group rich proteins and some polysaccharides uh, can act as uh, cation binding macromolecules uh, that can uh, control, uh, concentrate, saturate the microenvironment with some salts, some cations, and uh, uh, favor the, the precipitation of secondary minerals. Clearly, we try to identify the fungal uh, species that were observed with the scanning electron microscope. So we, we started trying to isolate them. Uh, and then uh, in order to get uh, long sequences, uh, so not only the Illumina short read that can be obtained by sequencing uh, the amplicons uh, uh, all together with Illumina uh, machines, we try to, um, to use uh, uh, the clone sequencing approach. So we prepared a clone library uh, extracting DNA from the small fragments that we could uh, obtain uh, from the conservators. Uh, and um, using the ITS-124, we uh, obtained some, uh, some sequences. Uh, the, the isolates, the, the fungi that grew in a culture where all xerophilic species like uh, Talaromyces, but they were not what we really observed. Only Cladosporium was uh, actually observed in the, in the scanning um, images. All the others were hardly uh, identifiable. Uh, and this is a list of uh, uh, the clones and in red, the isolates. And uh, among the clones, uh, only the Stremellales here, Cistophilo basidiace, uh, had some species which were resembling our uh, yeast and uh, nothing that could be uh, associated to the scopulariopsis uh, uh, structures. So we found uh, uh, some clones that were uh, um, corresponding to what we could isolate, but not much. So there is a li little correspondence between the clones we uh, sequenced and the species uh, that we could isolate uh, in, um, in, in the petri dishes. Uh, observing some um, uh, scanning electron microscope images, uh, we, we, we can uh, say that there were many different species altogether. So it was really a community and they were all growing. So it was not only something deposited in the dust, at least uh, uh, what we cloned, but there were many different uh, fungi growing altogether. Also, these large structures here uh, were probably uh, other yeasts because you can see some, scar um, some scars for, from budding cells, and there were many of them, you see. So it was really uh, interesting. And also, some other shapes, although uh, dried out, they, were, mm, they could be recognized more or less, like this one, which was probably a cladosporium. Uh, in order to, to find uh, the, uh, the species that we, we, we observed with the scanning electron microscope, we also tried another approach, which is using the nanopore sequencing uh, that uh, allows very long sequences to be obtained and so more uh, uh, informative from a taxonomic point of view. So the nanopore system um, is a, considered a third uh, generation sequencing uh, uh, technique. And um, there, is a, <clears throat> uh, there are some databases that can be used for a sort of direct identification of the reads that are obtained. But in our case, um, probably because of, the, um, of all the metals and the, uh, the, the, the compounds that could uh, have uh, acted as a um, some kind of contaminants for the, um, for the PCR, we couldn't obtain the library based on the ITS uh, markers. So we could only obtain the 28S uh, RNA gene sequences. And uh, from these sequences, we could uh, um, identify among the reads uh, the Merachia uh, uh, yeast uh, uh, species, 
which actually is not so uh, well it has structures and which are very similar to what we observed in our samples and uh, this marakia uh, is a, a a species which is uh, related to cold environments it has been found in uh, in greenland uh, in antarctica on the alps uh, is cosmopolitan uh, and is linked to very cold climates and this matches somehow with the the fact that we um, uh, we identified a mechanism that probably uh, was uh, correlated with the uh, the position of drops of water because of the dew point uh, so with very cold climate inside the museum, uh, probably water was condensating and this very, uh, this organism that could grow with low temperatures probably were, uh, were growing. Uh, so not just uh, allophilic, serophilic species, but species capable of growing in that very special microenvironment. And then at, uh, at last we get some sequences uh, for Scopulariopsis, but also Shedosporium, which is not far from what we observed. So this is the Scopulariopsis and this is the Shedosporium. So the structures, the, cha uh, the chains of truncated uh, uh, conidia that we documented probably were either Shedosporium or Scopulariopsis, but the species could not be uh, uh, found, I mean, identified. So we, we only, uh, we remain on the genes. So to conclude, we, uh, we show that uh, fungi can really uh, modify the appearance of bones and uh, also uh, ivory. And uh, that mm, at least in this last study, the one with the hope uh, skeleton, um, we show that uh, there was a complex uh, system uh, where also gypsum and iron oxides participated to the deterioration of the specimens. Uh, there was a biofilm involved uh, that uh, somehow uh, worked also on uh, plaster and nails, uh, and the bone particles were covered with this biofilm, and there were also secondary minerals deposited on the materials, on the specimens. Um, Different fungi were uh, somehow documented uh, and they probably acted with different mechanisms. So we have uh, calcium leaching, leaching, phosphor mineral dissolution, and also iron oxidation. And some of these species that we could isolate were allophilic uh, and there were many yeasts. Um, we couldn't match many of the species that we observed and those that we uh, listed with a cloning approach. Uh, the role of exopolymeric uh, material produced by microorganism was uh, quite, um, uh, was resembling, uh, was um, important in the, in the production of these uh, secondary hydroxyapatite uh, nanoplatelets. Uh, what um, is clear is that this uh, deposition of iron uh, was uh, uh, probably uh, a passive process because those spores seem like seem uh, not uh, not alive, uh, at least those totally covered with iron. So we don't know if uh, these uh, exopolymeric substances acted just as uh, nucleation sites uh, or um, the charges of the uh, active fungus could have uh, uh, somehow induced the process and. Uh, uh, created these uh, shells of iron with inside the spores. Uh, I, what I showed is the, the fruit of uh, different collaborations and three different papers, which were published with uh, uh, these groups of uh, uh, scientists. In particular, uh, I want to thank the, the Natural History Museum, of course, uh, and the synthesis uh, program, which uh, allowed uh, the, the study on the hope uh, skeleton. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Flavio, for what is, was a really interesting talk. Um, there's now time, there's lots of time for questions. Um, so if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, if you could type it into the chat, and that's going to save any confusion from uh, unmuting. So any questions in the chat? 
Um, oh, here we are. We've got, got one straight off the bat, which is fantastic. So we have a question from uh, Venos who asks, should creators of archaeological bone be concerned by the deterioration and how can you prevent growth? Yes, the, the, well, the curators were um, clearly interested by, by the study. Uh, at the beginning, the study was mainly to, to evaluate uh, if the cleaning uh, of the bones was, uh, was good. So if the dust and the microbiome present on the bones was uh, somehow eliminated with the, 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 the procedures that they were uh, putting in place. But uh, um, to prevent, it's mainly, a, probably the process I described is uh, something that happened in 80 years and the specimen were uh, well preserved. So it's something happening at a very small scale. Uh, for sure, um, the, the, the problem is uh, uh, linked to uh, the, 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 the climate, the microclimate. So, uh, dropping temperatures, of course, that can create some microclimates because of the deposition of dew, um, dew point water, on, especially on cold surfaces like uh, metals. So to avoid this kind of processes, probably uh, a good um, procedure is to enhance ventilation and to avoid the uh, uh, sudden drops in temperatures. This can be one, one possibility. I hope I answered. Fantastic. We've, we've got um, another question from Caitlin who asks, uh, can you see more accessible mechanisms for identification of fungal growth that could be readily used by museum curators? Well, um, you mean uh, uh, methods for identifying or uh, methods for uh, uh, showing that there is a biodeterioration in action? So, I think me methods for identifying. Yes, for identification, I think that this uh, nanopore system is now much used because it can be used also on site. Uh, the, the sequencing uh, instruments are portable. Uh, the, the protocols can be very easy to, to be used. So and it's increasing the, the, the speed. And so probably with uh, um, uh, some better databases, uh, a very fast identification, especially of living organism, because one of the problem is that often in, in our case, um, I think that many of the organism that we documented on the specimens were no longer alive, just some of them were living. And um, so I'm sure that, that with new sequencing te techniques, it, it will be easier to identify them. I'm reading another question. Yeah, we've got a question from Cameron who asks, if the skeleton was so old, the appearance of these fungi could have been at any period in its history. Um, or do you have an idea from the state of the fungi when they appeared or how long they had been there? Well, I think that probably before the uh, heating uh, of the... Um, now, the museum is, uh, is uh, the, the temperature uh, environmental climate is uh, controlled now, but it, it hasn't been for hundreds of, well, yes, for hundreds of years. So it's something new, the fact that you can control so well large uh, environments. So probably these um, changes in temperature and this, uh, uh, the growing of these shells with the fungi inside, it's something which is uh, cyclical. So probably it was due to uh, seasonal variation and very slow growth. So my idea is that these processes are, are really slow. And maybe uh, now there are still some growing organism on materials. Uh, so probably it changed a lot, the, the, the ecosystem. And it is probably a natural uh, su succession of species. So you find some which are really uh, old and they are still there, you can still document there but some are uh, recent probably. And also those that we could uh, isolate, the xerophilic ones, they were probably organism still living and active on the materials. Fantastic. Um, 
fantastic. Um, oh, J Janet Quinn uh, has got a question. Um, uh, I'm curious to know if the biofilms were solely compromised of fungi, or did you find ev evidence of polymicrobial biofilms? The, the were microbes, yes. In the in the paper that maybe Emma put in the chat, it's the last one on iron, uh, um, on the iron uh, uh, mechanism on the nails. In that paper, we we show that there are also plenty of bacteria growing, but they were not so. Um, there were m many more fungi in the end. So probably, especially the biofilm was uh, was containing also different species of bacteria. <clears throat> Thank you so much. We've got a question from Scarlett who asks, could this fungi impact other types of archaeological items, for example, books, pottery, ceramics, and other, not, uh, other items not made of bone? Yes, of course, there are many different fungal species and the the ecology of uh, indoor environments is fascinating and if you are curious to to look at very particular uh, situations just check for the fungal species which is called Eurotium allophilicum it is a fungus that uh, we are uh, finding everywhere in the indoor environments and it's very slow uh, it, it's growing very slowly and uh, uh, it can grow on any surface. It's very. Uh, it can eat just dust, and uh, it's a, it is an, an amazing uh, organism that can grow on books. And I found it on the uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, portrait. Just to say one. <laughs> Someone's asked, um, or the BMS office is asked if you can spell spell that name. Of this fungus, I'll write in the chat. Well, while we're waiting for that, is anyone more questions? Ah, fantastic. We've got another question from Caitlin in the chat, uh, who asks, have you been able to identify a material pattern of degradation? Uh, what is the largest, most visible degradation from fungus that you have encountered? Sorry, I'm writing. I'm I'm not, yeah. multitask not multitasking. <laughs> Please ask again. Uh, so, Caitlin asks Have you been able to identify a material pattern of degradation? What is the largest or most visible degradation from fungus that you have encountered? Well, uh, during flooding of libraries, I, I saw uh, like green yards of fungi growing on materials. But I mean, in that case, it's the huge amount of water that is available and the organic material that, that is made by, for example, books that make the fungi to grow a lot. But in terms of a pattern of degradation, um, maybe on wood, some kind of circular lacrimans uh, attacks on wood can be very massive. It's not a question, but we've got a comment from Ruth Love who says, many thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, I am a dentist, so very interested in the hydroxypatite, fluoropatite content of the talk. Um, I suppose expanding on that, can you see applications for dentistry and what you've been, and the work you've been doing? Well, all these uh, new platelets of uh, hydroxyapatite, I guess that some fungi can actually be used to in bioprocesses to, to precipitate new forms of nanomaterials, maybe. And we've got a question from Jane Haydecker who asks, is foxing of books caused by a fungus? Well, foxing is, a, uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, is a, uh, the, the typical rusty small spots on old books that is even used in fake, uh, in the reproduction of uh, aged paper. And foxing is uh, controversial because uh, uh, it's said that it can be caused by metals in paper, but uh, according to Arai, who is a Japanese uh, uh, 
scholar who studied foxing for all his life, he found that some fungi, uh, very slow growing xerophilic fungi, they can release in small um, areas of uh, materials, also silk, not only paper, and also other um, uh, tissues. Uh, they can release um, the proteins and also uh, uh, carbohydrates, like also trellos, so sugars. And proteins and sugars with the uh, aging can uh, cause a sort of reaction of condensation, which is called, called the Maillard reaction of condensation. And they um, start a sort of oxidation of the material, of the fibers, and also release a colored compound. So probably there are different kinds of foxing. Some are due to metals and other are, may, are due to, to biological reasons, biological uh, mechanism. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your questions. I'm just gonna ramble for a couple more seconds in case there's any more questions appearing in the chats. Um, but I'm sure um, I think it's been absolutely amazing talk and really, really interesting. Certainly, I'm going to be uh, making sure um, oh, check, checking all the museum materials I, I look at for, for fungal specimens. Are there any questions in the chat? There are not. So thank you ever so much for giving a wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'd like to pass over to Clive for any final words you'd like to say before we end the meeting. Hey, thanks really all of you for participating. Well, thank you everyone. Um, we look forward to seeing you next month for our Christmas talk. Um, we'll be sending out details about that shortly. Until then, keep safe and have a wonderful, wonderful time. <laughs>